Um, all right. So this is an interesting time for this chat because um, I did a similar talk or I did a talk on, on the metaverse over the summer for the first cohort um, for VCA. And uh, it's changed so dramatically over just a few months that um, I'm sure the next time this talk happens, there'll be a lot uh, much more different things to discuss as well. Uh, so it, it's a really exciting time to talk about this. I think the term itself has evolved a ton. It's a very contentious term. I think it's a term that's abused a lot. Um, but we're going to get into a bit of the terminology of, of metaverse itself um, and also looking at examples of architecture and virtual worlds and what that means, what that means for a designer, what that means for people exploring architecture and what distinguishes virtual architecture, digital architecture from real world building. Um, so many of you know, um, that the term itself actually came or originated in 1992 when it was coined by the author Neil Stevenson for a novel called Snow Crash. So you'll see this as a kind of, um, you know, a big mantra for the, the movement itself, looking at kind of a cyberpunk world. Um, and uh, ever since then, metaverse, for whatever reason, the kind of terminology really hooked. And I think it's um, captured the minds and imaginations of people, especially in this blockchain movement over the last couple of years. But from Snow Crash, uh, or aside from Snow Crash, you guys might know of the term metaverse from a handful of different apps. These are just four of them, but these are kind of the big four right now in the Ethereum space, Crypto Voxels, Decentraland, Somnium Space, and Sandbox. Um, and each of these are kind of collectively accessible virtual worlds. There are environments that you can build in, that you can um, explore in. I'm sure you all are very familiar with, with some of these uh, or maybe not. So we'll kind of go over a few things, but also keep it a bit of a high level overview of, of what they are. Um, each of them have their own kind of flavors. They're very different from one another and that makes for very exciting architecture and very exciting uh, spaces to explore. Some of them are more gamified, some of them are a little bit more underground. Uh, CryptoVoxels, as you know, is this kind of pixelated uh, or, or cube-based world that, um, or Vox-based world that you can build in, while Somnium Space is very different. It's more of a kind of naturally aesthetic, um, uh, natural world. Um, and Decentraland is kind of a blend of, of gaming and uh, low poly kind of environments. And Sandbox uh, is the, the new kid on the block, so to speak, uh, which focuses on gaming and uh, is developing some really incredible things. Um, and then, of course, Facebook. Um, Facebook just came out with their announcement for Meta. And uh, that's obviously been super contentious, co-opting a word that um, is a little bit bizarre to see them co-opting a word from Snow Crash or from uh, these decentralized metaverses. Um, and I think, you know, there's a lot to be determined about what this will ultimately mean for, for all of us, for the way we interact. I think it's a very, you know, it's obviously a very forward-looking approach at how we look at our virtual environment. And I think the, one of the reasons why this is resonating with people now so strongly is that the last two years we've had this global pandemic, we've been working indoors, we've been connecting with people virtually. So we're much more, um, we're much more willing to connect in a virtual sense. And I think this is why a lot of these things have been, have been pushed to the forefront. So, um, it's, uh, I guess we could call it Facebook, Facebook meta, not sure anymore. It's a little bit frightening, but it's also a little bit exciting to see what this evolves into. Um, and I think it's the beginning of us starting to look at what a centralized virtual world looks like and what a decentralized virtual world looks like. So it, it may end up being the kind of, you know, the meta, the Facebook of, of the metaverse versus a kind of Ethereum based or Tezos based or blockchain based kind of um, uh, environment. 
Um, there was a very interesting thread on this topic that just came out uh, after the Facebook announcement. And uh, this is Sean VP, and he was saying, uh, he had a, a thread on what if everyone is wrong about the metaverse, thinking about it as a virtual place, what if it's not a place at all? So he goes on to make the argument about what if it is a time, what if it's a period of time that we're entering. Um, and I think this is a really interesting, it's a very interesting thread. A lot of it I tend to agree with, um, thinking of the metaverse as kind of a movement and thinking of it as a point in time similar to, um, you know, singularity when like uh, you're looking at robotics and AI kind of surpassing the intelligence of humanity. So he made that comparison. And I think what this comparison ultimately leads to is thinking about a flippening of how much time we spend in a virtual environment uh, versus a physical one. And so I think this is a really interesting topic of looking at where we ultimately spend our time and what we value because time is our most precious resource. It's our ultimately most valuable thing. And where we decide to spend that time really is a vote in some ways. Um, and I think there are some interesting arguments made in this thread looking at how much screen time we have, how much time do we spend on our computers, whether that's our smartphone or our desktop or our laptop or an iPad, any kind of tablet, or ultimately how much time are we going to be spending in VR. Um, but, you know, he goes on to make the argument about looking at how much time throughout this kind of digital and internet and web movement, how much time we've continued to spend online doing different things. And um, I do think we are approaching a point where we spend more time with uh, digital real estate, so to speak, digital screens, digital uh, and pixels, rather than we do for physical things. Um, and that's fascinating to me as an architect, as someone with a design background. Um, uh, I have a background in urban planning and uh, lots of different types of architecture. So the implications for this in the way that we look at cities and the way that we look at how people kind of collectively um, come together is really fascinating. There are a lot of spatial implications for this that people are spending more and more time uh, virtually and connected virtually. Um, so this is an image I took at the Barclays Center in Brooklyn during a protest this past year. And I think, you know, the protest for me in, uh, this is a bit of a departure from what we might uh, look at, but this will make sense in a moment. Um, protests are highly social and highly connected um, gatherings. They're, they're these kind of impromptu movements. And I think cities create these spaces or need these public spaces like at the Barclays Center here to allow the public to breathe, allow people to have a moment to come together to make themselves heard in a way that they haven't been able to make themselves heard before. Um, this past couple of years in New York and all around the world, there have been these incredible protests and, um, and uh, moments where we've all been locked indoors, but you know, people are coming out together in a way to show defiance against things that um, demonstrate injustice. Uh, and I, I like this image for a lot of reasons. There's the kind of, you know, police up on the roof there on the right. Um, and uh, in New York, it's very contentious with the police and how they treat different populations in New York. And uh, obviously, especially um, black uh, groups in New York. So this is an interesting photo. And simultaneous to this, I went to this protest and later, I think it was later that day, I went to a, um, a march in crypto voxels. So this was, you can see Justice for Floyd graffitied on the left. This is obviously a much smaller crowd, um, but it was a way to kind of get people together in the virtual world and have a similar demonstration. It's obviously not the same scale, definitely not the same impact, but I think it was, it was fascinating that both things happened simultaneously that there were these virtual environments that are 
cooperatively owned, uh, collectively accessible, and you can have these uh, demonstrations in your backyard physically, but also, you know, virtually. And I think what this did was for people who aren't in New York or aren't in a place where they might have a, a gathering like that, these virtual worlds offer an outlet for people to explore these things and to, to do a march. So in CryptoVoxels, we walked, um, it was, I think, a, a walking down a particular avenue um, in Origin City. And it was really powerful along the way people had converted their builds to uh, show support for George Floyd and show support for the movement. There were, I think, known Origin had a exhibition and a couple of speakers to talk about injustice in their community. And it was a really powerful gathering. It was a small gathering, but to me, this is a pretty powerful indicator of this flippening of looking at how we look at the virtual space as becoming parallel or becoming more similar to our real world and offering things to people that maybe they wouldn't otherwise have access to. Um, that can mean a voice, that can mean a place, it can mean a lot of things. So ultimately to me, I think what the metaverse, quote unquote metaverse provides people is accessibility. Um, and that's a pretty powerful thing. It's, it's I mean, uh, this word will evolve and change a lot uh, for me, I'm sure. But I think ultimately, the ability to access kind of a, a joint space where you can have a voice and collectively protest on something and use a decentralized infrastructure to do that, that's really powerful. And I have the benefit of being in New York City, I'm based in Brooklyn, and I have a lot of these things that I take for granted right outside my door, but I know that's not the same for people around the world. And if you can have a website that you can access or a virtual world that you can plug into, um, that someone in New York can just the same as someone in, uh, you know, all the way across the world in anywhere, uh, that's a really powerful thing. And I don't think we've even begun to see the implications of this because the building tools are still so new. Um, but that moment of accessibility, this is like a web three access. This is a really powerful new thing where you know people used to join apps and they would be on apps together. Now it's people can build apps together. And I think that's what these metaverses are doing is when you can start to build a neighborhood, meet your neighbor virtually, create things collectively. That, that's a really powerful notion that I don't think we yet fully understand. Um, so in the last discussion um, that uh, when I presented this a few months ago, we looked at uh, past precedents. So we looked at other moments in history where technology was emerging for the first time and how that impacted architecture, how that impacted culture and how people were looking at, um, looking at their spaces and their cities differently uh, as a community. So a couple of projects, I'm a little biased here, obviously, because I have an architecture background, but I love the radical architecture movement of the 1960s and 70s. So um, a couple favorites of mine looking back here are Super Studio. This is uh, part of a continuous monument project where, you know, at the time you're looking at, this is the 1971, you're looking at humanity in a different light. You're looking at how the world is becoming connected for the first time in a different way through technology. You're looking at energy impact. This is the kind of flower power movement era. This is the era of people looking at pollution, looking at waste. This is after the kind of consumerism, consumerist culture of the 1950s in the United States. Um, so this was a really pivotal time period in the uh, late 70s, or sorry, late 60s, early 70s of looking at our society and figuring out what it is we want out of it. What do we, what do we crave? And a lot of that is that human connection and that accessibility to one another. And that's something for the first time globally through technology, people were able to do through the television, through lots of different technology, they were able to connect in a way that they could never have connected before. 
Um, so Super Studio, this is an Italian collective of architects. They looked at how to create these collages that really represented this moment in time of new types of connection and how um, architecture could be honestly reduced or destroyed in a way to make sure that we have this moment of clarity and connection with one another. Um, I love this, this collage. This is looking, to me, this, this really represents a lot of kind of a consumerism sort of culture, um, really a perspective about how uh, are we defined by our things or do our things define us? Uh, this, this project looked at this kind of super grid, this hyper grid, this kind of highway of grids that we could populate or be assigned to. Um, it was a very sort of uh, matrixy look at the world uh, through this kind of continuous monument that was that they that they um, theorized about. Um, and I really love this image because I think it it's this collage and this project gets to the heart of what was happening at the time, which was how do we connect with one another in a genuine way, um, and how do we kind of reduce our reliance on things uh, to make for a better humanity. And I think that was a lot of what the critique of this project was about. Um, and so this continuous monument, there are a lot of these beautiful collages, which I encourage you guys to look at if you're not already familiar with them. Um, but Super Studio did these beautiful images of, of the grid kind of interacting with cities with New York City, there's a beautiful image um, with natural environments. And I think the point was to show this kind of superimposition of uh, what what information and what connectivity does across our world, and how that uh, how that new layer engages us in different ways and forces us to look at both worlds in a new light. Um, so the metaverse is not, you know, this is not new. This is, uh, we've always had moments in history that challenge us to look at our world in a different light. Usually, you know, in a lot of respects, it's driven by technology and cultural changes. And I think this is a really beautiful image that kind of shows those two layers of the natural world and uh, something else that's more abstract and less defined. Um, this is House Rucker Co. There were a handful of collectives at the time, and I'm not going to show all of them, but you know, Super Studio and House Rucker Co. had lots of similar ideologies looking at um, uh, looking at the world around them. Um, I can't remember the name for this this one on the left. I think it was like uh, oh, it had a great name. I think it was something along the lines of um, kind of a information bubble or pollution bubble or something, but. Uh, I think a lot of the world at the time was dealing with uh, wrestling with propaganda and how to kind of mediate the world around them. These guys created these hilarious, amazing looking masks that to me look a lot like wearables. Um, and this looks a lot like what's happening now, creating a kind of d identity for themselves that also serves as uh, a filter for the world around them and allows them to see new things in a new respect. This is obviously pre-computer era in a lot of regard. This is pre-internet. This is the 60s. So, you know, already at the time, people were grappling with how do we create our own spaces that allow us to explore and see the world in a different light. And this was a really powerful uh, movement that allowed them to do this. And uh, they had some amazing installations here. So, you know, that's the individual. I think Archigram looked at the larger scale, uh, similar to Super Studio, and especially in respect to cities. Uh, this is a walking city created by Archigram in 1966. Um, and they focused a lot on how infrastructure was changing to create, uh, they did a lot of kind of sarcastic in some ways uh, projects, looking at how uh, cities will change over time and how they can potentially migrate around the world. So this is a, a walking city that would move from place to place, connect with other cities through these series of tubes and pipes and other infrastructure. And, um, you know, to me, this really resonated with looking at the metaverse because each one is like its own app 
It's uh, Decentraland, CryptoVoxel, Somnium Space. They're all kind of populated by the same users in a lot of respect. Uh, they each have their own flavor, their own style. But, you know, a lot of these principles uh, were kind of explored early on and obviously even before the 60s. But they, you know, back then they just created these really beautiful images that explored these topics. And um, I love this one. Um, here's another plug-in city, which looked at a super infrastructure for how cities could connect with one another, create a kind of gamified shared infrastructure that could build autonomously create uh, apartments, infrastructure for people. Um, this is, uh, <laughs> there are a lot of interesting uh, annotations in this, but it was about creating kind of a modular world that you could plug into and that a city could kind of assemble itself. To me, this is um, watching the metaverses unfold and how you see different builds popping up in Decentraland and crypto voxels over time. This is this feels very much like an archigram project of a plug-in city where the infrastructure is laid for you and then everyone can collectively build and assemble things. Um, I love this image. This drives, uh, if you're familiar with any of my artwork, a lot of my artwork is inspired by uh, archigram and they were a big influence um, for me early on in my architecture career and uh, continue to be especially even more so now as the metaverse unfolds. So meta architecture, um, we've looked at a couple past projects and, and looking at how past movements inspire new things. Um, this term is, uh, is, is a, a working term. This is something that I think will evolve continuously over time. I do agree that it's more of a time period, less of kind of a physical place or a physical thing that we can ultimately define. Um, but there are new rules with, with virtual and meta architecture that I think distinguished it from the physical things and even from the things we saw in the 60s and 70s. Um, those projects were obviously still materially based and we don't have those restrictions in a virtual world. Um, so that makes for a very interesting and different environment to explore. This is, uh, this is me jumping in the air in the incubator of Crypto Art District and Somnium Space. This was the first time that I built a, um, that I had a project built in Somnium Space. This was a, uh, almost exactly a year, well, a little over a year ago now. Um, and times have changed. But uh, it's, when you build in a virtual world, um, there are different rules. There are different things that you can abide to or have to abide to or don't have to abide to. Um, for me, this project was extremely eye-opening. This was also my introduction to the Museum of Crypto Art. Um, at the time, they were giving land to people who applied for land with different ideas. And this district, uh, which, you know, uh, the Vertical Crypto Art Residency has a number of plots in this district. Uh, it's becoming a playground for exploring what the virtual world means and what architecture can mean uh, virtually. And it's a really incredible place with, with that I encourage everyone to visit if you haven't visited um, IOKA yet. But um, I think what a lot of these builds explore is what do these new rules mean for spaces? How do you display art in a virtual world that's different from a physical gallery? And I think a lot of these projects are very abstract, very uh, interesting and incredibly diverse, very visually different, as you can see in this image. Um, there may be four or five different quote unquote gallery spaces in this image alone. Some of them move, some of them are glowing, some of them just float, others are more literal. Um, but there's a lot of floating because you don't have to respect gravity uh, and you don't have to respect materiality in a virtual world. And I think it's, it, it makes for really unusual physical environments because if architecture does not have to react to materiality, if that's no longer a constraint, if you no longer have to worry about a roof on a building or glass to keep weather away or gravity, um, then, you know, what is the purpose of a window? What is the purpose of a doorway? I think all of a sudden you look 
at a building and the elements that compose a, a traditional building start to start to change. So um, what I'm excited for with meta architecture is all of us, and that's that's everyone on this call, you know, collectively challenging what it is to have a building virtually, to have an artwork that's digital. Um, this is a, these are new mediums. You don't have pigmentation. You don't have uh, um, you don't have paint. You don't have canvas. This is a totally new medium, and I think we're just still scratching the surface of what this can mean. Um, this is at the beginning during the installation of the Museum of Crypto Art Museum, the Genesis Collection Museum in Somnium Space, uh, which uh, was very fortunate to be brought aboard MOCA as a resident architect. So I work with them on various gallery installations and buildings. Uh, this is during the process of putting together what the museum could look like and figuring out what that would be and what that uh, could look like. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. And to me, uh, this is a building that didn't need to have walls. This is a building that didn't need to have roofs. Um, and if that's the case, then what, <laughs> what does a building even mean or look like? Um, in the end, uh, Shivani and Colborn were very kind to let me explore a lot of very funky ideas, <laughs> including this kind of rotating frame that, uh, as it extrudes and rotates along, it sort of creates a cavernous effect and creates a new kind of wall that I think isn't uh, a traditional wall, but something that sort of projects outward and can be manipulated in different ways. Um, this particular building looked a lot at QR code patterns and thinking about how we take a language from the crypto art movement and translate that to a building. Um, so a lot of the way the frames are and a lot of the kind of look and feel of how art is displayed is, you know, trying to be evocative of a QR code and the kind of square patterns of things. Um, this is from the rooftop of the Genesis Museum. And you can see the kind of buildings in the distance across Somnium space. Um, highly recommend going up to the roof of this museum if you guys haven't had a chance to already. Um, I think we're going to organize some tours soon so we'll have a chance to do that all together if you have not yet um but you know with this museum we're really trying to think about how to showcase art differently how to um explore a new type of gallery that couldn't otherwise exist physically and that i think is uh why you see floating floating art uh super scale i mean these are these are like 30 meters high um, <laughs> these displays so they're it's large and it's purposefully large so that you know you're you have this monumental environment that obviously you can never build in real life it just wouldn't wouldn't make sense um and at night you know somnium space is just a really beautiful environment in virtual reality and all of these screenshots were taken in in um in vr and um it the the kind of light quality that's created there is really beautiful and elegant and it's very natural which is kind of unusual it, it kind of grounds you in a way and makes you feel like you're you're in a place that's familiar but then there's floating art and there's kind of walls and roofs that that almost move above you and that's a really bizarre kind of environment to walk around in so I think what's nice about these virtual worlds is in architecture, you can play with things that ground you and give you a sense of place, like a, an archway or a doorway or a window it gives you a sense of scale, but then you can twist it and flip it upside down to give people the, the sense that, oh, this isn't a traditional place. There's different rules at play here. Um, so this comes back to that, that uh, topic of accessibility and connectivity what the museum is able to do is it doesn't it's not grounded to a physical place in the in the same sense as a guggenheim or a museum um uh and or mocha uh, or not mocha sorry um well there are other mochas another mocha in the real world um museum of contemporary art this is a very different type of environment and I think what's special about it is you can gather people from around the world all in one place and have people experience it. And 
um, that's a really special thing. That's not something that we've really been able to do like this before. And so this is, um, I think, Shivani doing a artist tour with different artists that are showcased in the collection. And it's a really beautiful thing to have people around the world come together, talk about the art, visit, have impromptu gatherings, and it's free to enter. Uh, there are no doorways, there's no ticket booth. And I think that makes for a very different experience that is borderless and in, entirely free. And um, that's very liberating to have culture that isn't safeguarded by a ticketing experience or by location. And I think we're going to see some really powerful results of that, where if you can create a kind of cultural experience like a museum, and it's not limited by uh, price or geography, um, that's pretty powerful. And I think we're, we're going to see a lot of that take place. And I know the Museum of Crypto Art is really challenging those, those notions and creating an open and free and accessible kind of environment for people to to create, to curate, to explore new things. Um, so I love these images. These are just different views from people. Uh, there's Colborn in the lower right, um, different users exploring the, um, the museum from their own perspective. And these are the little avatars. Some of them are custom, some of them are the default ones. I still need to work on my avatar here. Uh, mine, as you saw before, it still looks like this guy. And I've been getting a lot of flack from Somnium people that I need to update and up my game a little bit. So uh, next time I might just be a giant cube or something, that would be fun. Um, but yeah, I think seeing people gather, dance, hang out, have a concert, like all these things happen in this building. And um, it's pretty powerful. It's exciting to see as an architect because, you know, it's very rare that uh, an architect ever actually gets to see something from start to finish being being built. It's usually a decade long process in most, most respect, most respects. And um, so in this kind of virtual environment, you can move fast, break things, create, iterate, explore, update. And I think that makes for a very different and dynamic architectural world where the buildings change very frequently. The art on the walls changes. You can have an exhibit pop up in the matter of weeks when, you know, in the physical world, it would take months or years. And um, that is going to have profound effect on, on the world and the internet as these things become more and more accessible. Uh, I love this image. This is Snow Crash, if you guys know Snow Crash, um, named after the, the novel, of course. Uh, I don't know if this is Neil Stevenson. Maybe it is. I actually don't know his real identity. Um, could be. That would be fun. But here's him taking a selfie uh, at the Museum of Crypto Art and Somnium Space during its construction. Um, this is fun because it was during construction and he popped by, saw it, and took a picture. And that's how open this stuff is. You know, you can see a building as it's being installed and tested on. Um, what we do at MoCA is pretty frequently upload buildings, test them out, do a site walkthrough, you know, measure things, uh, and then iterate on it and continue to update it. And I think that's a really incredible, uh, for me, it's very surreal <laughs> to have kind of a virtual site visit and being, you know, measuring things to see if, if uh, artwork fits if the eye level is right, um, if we need a stairway here or, you know, no walls there. But uh, I thought this was a good perspective looking at how a kind of, you know, in this particular view, it's kind of a deconstructed QR code in multiple dimensions that's split up across levels. And uh, the point of this build was really to frame the environment around it. Uh, the mountains in the distance across the water are a big part of some namespace and folding that environment into the building is super important to me. So I love this image because it frames everything perfectly. Um, and at the, at the center of it is the visitor, the person who explores it. So uh, this is one of my favorite images of the space and I couldn't take it. This is, this is a visitor who took it in an impromptu uh, visit. So um, that's a very exciting, very cool thing. Uh, another project here that we did um, not too long ago was Hack of a Bear. 
So this was a solo exhibition space and uh, Colbert and Shivani wanted to reimagine the Pantheon building in Rome and try to give it uh, a modern twist, but also give this, uh, there's a project by Hackettau, if you guys know Hackettau, um, who reinterpreted, they reinterpreted a bear head drawn by Leonardo da Vinci and created it, created what was a sketch of a bear head by Leonardo into a 3D uh, virtual reality bear head. And so we wanted to create a kind of bear cave, so to speak, for this work and showcase it alongside the Leonardo da Vinci drawing. And um, this is now part of the permanent collection, this bear head, which you'll see in a minute. But uh, this was a rendering of the space from up top. So it gives you a good sense of the dome. Um, again, playing with that kind of idea of a, a grid that sort of um, uh, folds from the ground into this dome. And uh, I think we had a lot of fun with this piece, but you can see the coffers on the inside here sort of deconstructing and each one connects on a vertex. So every single one you can see in this image right in the middle where the coffers connect right on an edge. And there are little things that like that that we like to play with that are obviously impossible in the real world, but you can create uh, you don't have gravity to worry about in a virtual space. So you can play with things and suggest things that are real, like a coffer, which evokes a sense of the real Pantheon in Rome, but connect it in a way that completely throws you for a loop and just sort of starts to build up a very surreal environment. Um, here's another rendering where you can see the bear head. So, and below it is the projection uh, and the drawing of a of Leonardo da Vinci's bear. Um, this was a beautiful project, Hackettau. Uh, it's a really incredible, incredible duo. And um, they sort of graffitied this bear head with all of these wonderful references to the crypto art and NFT movement. And um, they have tons of Easter eggs in there. I feel like they've had a couple puzzles that I've been un unable to crack so far. They have lots of references. Um, but it's a beautiful project. And here is the same building in Somnium space. So those were the renderings of it as we were putting it together and then we installed it virtually uh, right on the mountainside here in VR. And you can see the Oculus, it works. That was very exciting. <laughs> uh, we were hoping and we tested around a few different ways of getting the Oculus, which is the hole up at the very top. We were hoping that that would work in the sense of the real Pantheon in Rome that tracks, it's kind of like a sundial in a way, or a way of tracking the sun as it moves throughout the day. Um, and Insomnium, it's super cool. It's very neat to see the sun coming through, project that circle that you can see on the right. And um, that kind of eye from above sort of tracks across the room, eyeballs the bear at certain points of the day. And uh, it's a very neat project. And at night too, I think we have a couple images at night the moon does the same thing. So it's a really cool environment. Um, and here's a better image here of the, you can see the bear drawing by Leonardo da Vinci. And then this is sort of the floating projection of that, the modern projection of that with Hackettau's hack of a bear. And here's the same image at night. At night, it's super cool, very fun to visit um, and uh, neat environment. But honestly, a lot of the work is done by the <laughs> environmental effects of Somnium Space and what they've been able to create. So honestly, anything we would have put here would look cool. Uh, <laughs> but this was a very fun project and um, very interesting. So here's a colorful project. Um, this is the last one I'll bring up here and then we can get into a discussion if you guys have questions um, so you don't hear me blab on for too long, which I could do but I won't put you guys through that. Um, this is a project I've been working on called Forms. Uh, Forms explores the kind of uh, modular nature of meta architecture and exploring the idea of collectibles. Um, so this is a project I've been slowly working on. I haven't really broadcasted it a whole lot because I've been trying to make sure everything works, um, but this is a look at Decentraland and what I've been doing for this project is creating modular elements that you can connect that 
in, of, in and of themselves, they're each NFTs and each NFT comes with a 3D building element like a window or a stair or a kind of gateway and different elements that you can kind of combine together to compose buildings. Um, so for me, this was a way to explore the idea of collectible architecture. Uh, and there are lots of different types. I've been having fun with this and it's honestly helped me learn a lot about designing for metaverses and what you can and can't do. Um, each of these modular elements can connect with one another. They're all dimensioned similarly so they can connect. All the stairways connect properly to the uh, to the window next to it and, the, and that kind of thing. Um, but each one also respects the shading requirements, polygon counts, and um, and material demands of Decentraland. So each one I think is designed very specifically for to work in world. And that's been a really interesting experiment looking at how, what a, what a vernacular looks like in, um, in a virtual metaverse environment. So here's some early tests of looking at, all right, here we have a stairway and a gateway and a, and a window, like how do these things all connect? And so, and also work. So how does an avatar actually, you know, can an avatar walk up those stairs? Um, lots of different parts of this project that have been fun to learn about. And it's helped me um, in developing this project, it's helped me learn a lot about how to design in other worlds too, in an effective way. Um, but I've had a lot of fun with this. And uh, hopefully later on in the residency, we can visit a couple of buildings that incorporate forms um, so we can hop on them and walk around them and see different things, which would be fun. Uh, here's just a video to give you a sense of like, you know, there's the NFT itself, but then, you know, you can walk around them and explore around them and uh, interconnect them. So what now? Uh, that's the last of the precedent projects. I think the what now question is the big one. Now that Facebook is entering this and developing their environments, what, you know, what does this mean for us? What agency does it give us? What fire does it give us to build more, better, faster in some ways? Um, in terms of what now, uh, I love this image, uh, Insomnium Space. I think it's going to be messy. I think it's going to be a little bit of a challenge to figure out what do we what do we do? And it's going to take some trial and error. Uh, <laughs> this is Artur standing in front of um, some NFT cars that were being uh, tested <laughs> at the time at a racetrack to see if they work correctly. And I just love this image because I think this is like we're so it, it shows the excitement like we're so excited to be here but it's going to be really messy and it's going to be kind of a disaster before it gets better um so i wanted to finish on this image because i think it just exemplifies where we are in the metaverse so to speak and i think this is where we are in terms of architecture as well we're still figuring out the rules the rules are changing all the time but it's exciting and i think it's an opportunity for us to look at how to reinvent uh, what we know about buildings, what we know about cities, uh, what we know about um, accessibility and communication with one another. I think we have a really powerful opportunity to um, explore and be a part of something that, you know, not many moments in history have this opportunity to really create. A, this is an inflection point where we're able to connect in a way that we've never been able to connect. Um, the residency that you're in now is a perfect example of that in action. You're a group of people from all over the world with totally different backgrounds. And the opportunity for, for folks to connect in that way, it, it's few and far between. Um, that It doesn't happen very often. So these moments that, you know, like Nicole are creating, it, this is, this is in, it, in itself a metaverse of kind of opportunity to connect and create and collaborate with one another and learn quickly. It really allows you to learn in a way that you haven't been able to before. Um, so I will finish with this image and we can then open it up to questions if you have questions. But um, yeah, thanks again to Nicole for having me. And uh, this is always super fun to talk about these things and I can drone on and on, but um, would love to hear from you all if you have any questions.
So I, I want to thank you for this uh, wonderful presentation. I absolutely loved it. So thank you so much. Oh, thank you. Thank you. And I just closed the window. Who is the, could you speak again so I know which? Yes, uh, my, my name is Pierre. Uh, I'm yeah. based in, uh, in in Brooklyn, New York. So I <laughs> I know very well the Barclays Center, so I could totally r relate. Uh, uh, can I have a, a question for you? Of course, absolutely. Uh, I was very interested by the relation uh, between architecture, uh, urban planning, and politics. I, I think indeed th these two are really linked. And um, uh, by what I can see, I can see that a political message or a social uh, issue related messages are, are still not uh, um, uh, very frequent in the metaverse. I, uh, so my work is pretty political. There is a social criticism and, and politics in, in my body of work. And I, I don't see a lot of uh, artists that are introducing um, social criticism and, and social issue in the metaverse. I feel like uh, either collector or artists are a little bit shy that they don't want like to potentially offend people or don't want to push too hard or put too... Uh, talked too much about politics in the metaverse. So what is your opinion about introducing real life important social issues like social justice, uh, racism, discriminations into the metaverse to, 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 to create more awareness? I think uh, it's brilliant. I, I think that's a really important question and I, you're right. I don't think we see enough of that happening now, um, mostly because I think people are still in this kind of absorbing phase. People are absorbing these new tools, these new apps, how to use them. And then I think once we get over the hurdle of a lot of this onboarding, so to speak, I think then we'll start to see more tangible um, engagement around really using a hive mind of people to solve big, important political and, and cultural issues. And um, I think there is a hesitancy now to get too into the weeds of these things, mostly because, you know, we're in a market right now that's, uh, it's just, it's crazy right now. Um, and I think we saw more of those types of critical conversations when things were a little quieter, like a, a year or two ago. Um, that's when people really had these meetups and gatherings that were hyper-focused on issues, not on price action or the market. And I think we're going to get to that. Um, there's also a, an opportunity, too, to look at, you know, and, and I think you're alluding to this in your question, too, the politics of, of different blockchains and decentralized projects themselves and how we critique those as a community. Um, you know, a lot of these projects are, quote unquote, decentralized. And I think we're still figuring out what that means and how that works. Um, and I know, you know, for certain things, like in even in Decentraland, uh, when things are brought up or suggested, you know, it can be contentious. People can be really contentious about changes to the world. I remember um, uh, this is this is slightly off topic, but you know, they made an update to the rendering engine at one point, and all of the lights went off <laughs> in all of these buildings, including one of my own, um, because the the light render shaded uh, shader changed and that created kind of an uproar but my point is like there there's politics that are hyper local like that which are really interesting and we need to have more town hall meetings um but i think once the market sort of softens a bit we're gonna have those those super important conversations about discrimination accessibility and um and looking at how the virtual world, I think, can help augment or, or or react to those issues. Because it's a hive mind, we can learn faster, in my opinion. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you. Um, thank you. Those are great questions. And great to hear you in Brooklyn. Barclays is an interesting spot over the last couple of years uh, with everything going on. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> Thank you.
And if anyone has even a comment or, or a question, it could be anything. Um, it could be a question about a metaverse app. Um, I admittedly, I've used a lot of them, but I have not uh, used Sandbox much yet, admittedly. But there are others as well that if people have questions, happy to answer anything, even if it's just, how do I get land or anything like that? Um... Can I can I ask a question? Of course. Um, I wanted to ask you just like a more practical one because I would really love to acquire soon uh, like a VR set to start exploring VR more and everything in it. And I would I would like to know like which which gear do you think is is the, is the best one in your opinion to buy? Good question. Um, I think I have the Oculus Quest 2, and it's been it's been great. Honestly, it's a, it was um, more affordable than I thought it would be. I think it costs like two hundred ninety nine dollars, um, and it was pretty mind blowing the first time that I used it to explore a building that I was working on, and it uh, I highly recommend it. I think um, the one setback is uh if you if you wear glasses in real life uh make sure to get like a, a modifier thing for it um i don't wear glasses but i probably will in the next couple months because my eyes are totally fried <laughs> being in these things um, <laughs> so that's one setback with these these uh i would go for a more established headset like a quest um because i get headaches every so often in these things and um it's important to get one that has enough quality that you're not totally ruining your eyesight. Yeah, cool. Could you uh, later uh, write the name on the on the chat as well? Absolutely, yes. All I'll right, all right. Cheers, thank you. It was a great presentation, very interesting. Oh, thank you so much. I have a quick question. Yes. Um, so uh, my question is a little boring. First of all, thank you so much for this uh, uh, lecture. It's amazing or talk. I don't know how to, to call it. I have uh, graduated from architecture school and uh, speculative urban planning, I would like to say, but I never got to work in it. And I have a very, very boring question for you, which is um, what software do you personally feel um, most fits your needs and what would you suggest using thank you uh, yeah great quite awesome i'm so happy that there are architects um i, I like non-architecture people too by the way but i am very excited to have architects because there aren't a lot um in the space um i so i'm still uh, uh an old architecture person i use rhinoceros for a lot of modeling and uh, that's a pretty traditional um, architectural modeling software, 3D software. So my flow typically is doing a lot of prototyping in Rhino, and then I would bring something to Blender or use Blender for um, certain building elements that are easier to model there. And then pretty much all of like Decentraland takes GLB files um, and Somnium Space takes FBX files. So from Blender, it's very easy to export to these different places, and there's a lot of good documentation on um, on doing that. I can share; I'll share a handful of those things as well. But yeah, typically uh, from Rhino to Blender, and then out to whatever format is needed. That's that's been the best for me so far. Um, and I'm still gathering myself on Unity a little bit. Um, Unity is used for Somnium Space. So I typically import FBX files into Unity, do a little modification, and then and bring it there. It's still like modeling, honestly, in a lot of these worlds. It's very, there are a lot of requirements. So while you don't have gravity or you don't have a lot of things to worry about, there are a lot of things that you need to be mindful of to uh, upload properly like polygon count and um, other issues. Awesome, thank you so much.
there's just a, a question from Stefan on the chat that I'll read it out, um, which says, amazing presentation, thank you. One question from my side is, how would you get started being an architect in the metaverse? Hmm. Ooh, okay, yeah, we should pull up the comments here. Um, great question. How, how would you get started? So honestly, I think, um, I think what I did early on was, and I'm sure you guys are familiar with this, um, I went on Discord a lot and started exploring builder channels. Um, there's usually a builder channel for every metaverse space. And I think from there, I figured out that there are certain metaverse projects where you don't need land in order to build. Some, some land is extremely expensive, obviously. And uh, I see one question also says, you know, are land like tokens? And the answer is yes. Um, in a lot of these, in a lot of metaverses, the land that you're building on is in and of itself, it's an NFT. So you're building and you know populating that NFT with other NFTs like artworks. So it's a pretty cool process. Um, the NFT works itself like a, a land title in a way, like a deed for land. Um, but back to the question about, you know, how do you get started being an architect? I think the best thing to do is really start testing out how to build in these worlds. In um, Decentraland, they have a builder app that I can share after this, um, after this uh, discussion. And it's free to use. You don't have to have land. You can even share your build with other people. Um, you can do the same thing with, uh, with crypto voxels. You can build on kind of a playground stage and then share your build with other people. And I think that's the best way to get familiar with these tools. You don't have to own land, but you can still show off buildings and share them with others. Um, the one thing you can't do is pop in that land or pop in your building to you know the world itself. You need land to in order to do that. Um, but you still get a metaverse kind of vibe from it because you can share it with others. And um, I think that is how I learned how to build in these worlds is, is pretty much just trial and error. And then you sort of just post images of what you're working on. And then you kick up a conversation with other people. And um, honestly, it's very organic. Uh, anyone can be an architect. It's, it's really, you just start building and seeing what's possible. Um, I will, I see a couple questions here. Let's see. Um, ooh, I love, I'm going to look at some of these samples here. Um, I will share some links for sure. Uh, hoping to buy land. And this is from pop art by Beba. Uh, wondering if you're familiar with the super world app, which is an augmented reality, virtual world, which is geographically mapped onto the real world. Uh, I, I'm familiar with the super old app, but I, I, I don't know a whole lot about it. I'm, I'm more know of it. Um, I think it's super interesting that that's like a very, um, back to that super studio image of the hyper grid going over the landscape. That's like that project to me. It's really interesting. And I think, uh, we're already seeing people land grab, so to speak, trying to buy land of monuments and things that exist in real life because it's it's like um, virtual real estate. And um, I need to explore more about that, but I love AR work and I've been meaning to get more into AR myself, um, especially being here in New York. There's a lot of kind of pop-up art projects and there was a lot of this during the conference last week at NFT NYC of people exploring AR work. And um, I think it's another layer. It's another layer of this kind of collective metaverse. And I think they're all interconnected because we as users, we're like the connection points for these different apps and these different lenses. Um, and I think as we bounce around between these different apps, like, you know, Superworld or Somnium Space or um, anything else, I think, it's um, it's exciting. It's cool to see, and I think we're going to have better connectivity to those things in the future. But I have to explore more of Superworld. I wish I had more to say on that. Uh, 
Um, and I think, uh, oh, sorry, was there someone with a question? Uh, yeah, hi. Um, I was going to ask you, you were talking about the polygon count, and uh, I was wondering if all of these um, worlds are actually web-based and what are the restrictions and what can you see? Can you see it being like a limiter in the near future or the far future with it only being web-based? Uh, it's a great question. Um, the, each world has its own kind of restrictions. I think some of them are, are um, if I understand your question correctly, some of them are totally web-based. You just open a browser tab and you're there. Um, Somnium Space actually has kind of two components to it. It has a web app version where it's basically like the you're there at the building, you can explore the build. But then in order to actually go in world, so to speak, um, you have to put on a headset, download the app to the, your desktop, and it has to be a Windows desktop. Um, and uh, so there's there's like a lot of different kind of frequencies to it. Um, and each one has very different or, you know, slightly different polygon count limits. Um, and that can be that can be challenging. I think that's why we see a lot of uh, buildings now are, are not super complicated. They're very simple geometries, a lot of neon, a lot of things that pack a big punch. So I think what's cool about these this early phase of the metaverse is this kind of like very simple construction. You know, you see a lot of colorful construction, a lot of simple, very giant geometries. And um, I think that's as a result of the limitations. Um, eventually, my hope is that it's as easy to hop into these things as as a browser tab and you can just hop in. I think some of them, some apps do that better than others. Uh, I have a monster PC and I still have trouble getting into Decentraland sometimes because it's load in a ton of stuff I mean, it takes a while to to load um but yeah i think i think it's all getting better and it changes honestly every other month when i look in the requirements for this stuff sometimes my building that had lights in the front front of it just sort of go dim and um because they changed the rendering engine uh, requirements for it and a neon uh, object with emissions with an emission quality to it um it goes dim for some reason. So it's constantly trying to, you know, keep up with the change. Does that mean you have to reload the object or can you actually uh, modify it inside? So it depends. In a lot of cases, uh, I've had to reload the object entirely. Um, you're not able to, right now with a lot of these things, you can't edit textures or materials. If it's custom, at least, if you upload it custom, you can't change those materials kind of using a, the interface uh, with some if you're uploading like a custom shape or um, not a custom shape if you're uploading a shape using a builder like in somnium space in that builder you can just drop in a cube add uh, add neon to it and adjust the neon color and everything right there but if i had neon like a neon sign that i uploaded custom um that I would have to upload entirely again and test it out to see what works. So it's a lot of trial and error right now. And uh, I recommend, you know, having some like Advil for headaches on the side or something like that. <laughs> Keep your sanity. But it's fun. I don't mean to turn people off, but it's, it is a lot of trial and error. Uh, and yeah, to Nicole's point, like the first cohort built a beautiful exhibition space in Arium. And Arium is another example of a great uh, virtual world metaverse experience where um, I think you apply for land and they're also in the chat uh, pretty often working with Nicole. Yeah, we'll, have... be, we'll be having a session with them. So they'll probably give everybody access uh, as they did last time, like to anybody who wants to build, it'll be free. For sure. And they're super awesome. They have an incredible app and um, they were used. Uh, yeah, I mean, I'm sure you've seen the exhibition space that was created for uh, the residency and the auction. And it was amazing. It was beautiful. And that was a really cool project where like all these residents, uh, folks in the residency collaborated together. And um, so very cool project. Um, 
but yeah. Uh, do you consider, let's see, a couple questions. Uh, curious about the idea. Uh, Pop Art by Beba says, uh, another layer of collective metaverse, I'm curious about the idea of adding your own work around existing landmarks. First of all, I love your font. I have no idea how you're typing like that, but it's awesome. And uh, I love the idea of superimposing your work on an existing landmark. I think uh, I've been following a lot of, you know, forms of protest and different things here in New York. There's a big movement in the United States reimagining um, public monuments and looking at what a modern monument looks like for uh, different communities. In most cases, there are a lot of monuments that represent a totally different time period here in the States. And a lot of artists have been using AR and VR and um, other kind of layers to basically project their uh, their perspective over top a um, a marble statue in some ways. So um, I think it's a really cool way to kind of impose our own layer onto maybe an environment that doesn't work for us. And I think that's what the metaverse can do is, you know, when the physical world is not equitable for us anymore, we create our own. And I think that's what this movement can do and, and be really empowering for. Um, uh, Gabriel says, do you consider on cyber a metaverse? Uh, I do. I do. I think um, on cyber creates really beautiful, um, uh, beautiful gallery spaces for collectors to put in their NFTs. And I think one thing that, I mean, metaverse is such a tricky, I consider discord a metaverse in some respects. I think for me, um, a big characteristic though, of a metaverse is having something accessible at the same time so that you can be there with another person. So I, <laughs> Discord is Nicole's favorite matter. She lives in there. I'm sure she's had the flippening already. Uh, Nicole, I think, is plugged in. Um, <laughs> but yeah, I think generally, I do consider on cyber a metaverse, um, but I do think what creates a really important type of metaverse is having something that can be accessible by two people around the world at the same time, and they can meet there. I think that's the accessibility that I'm really excited about is virtual environments that you can meet someone in an impromptu way, um, and they might be halfway around the globe, and you've never had the opportunity to meet that person. That's the kind of serendipitous environment that I think we're all working towards. Um, and yeah, I think, uh, yeah, seeing others inside a space, it brings it to life. It adds so much character to it and spontaneity to it. Um, and that's, it's super exciting. Is there gamification inside these metaverses? I, yes, I think um, you're starting to see different worlds that have slightly different rules. I think Sandbox and Centraland are good examples of this, where you can kind of create a sort of sub game or, or sub app within a plot of land. And uh, you can do some of this stuff, I think, in, um, in other metaverses like Arium as well, where you can have kind of a real time, anything from like a real time price ticker to drawing in API information from other chains. Um, so it's a really good question. And I think, uh, oh, oh, did you say gentrification? Oh, I said gamification, that's funny. Oh, gentrification, yes, really good question. Um, I totally think there is. And I think it's gonna be a big, big problem because I do see a lot of companies land grabbing. And I think what happens there Sorry, I totally went off on gamification. Gentrification is a really fascinating topic for me personally. Um, I did a lot of work here in New York as an urban planner, looking at how we avoid that in certain neighborhoods and figure out more kind of sustainable solutions for gentrification. And definitely, <laughs> definitely um, we're gonna see an issue with land grabs where people can afford land that others can't. And so certain neighborhoods are gonna be very corporatized. And I think that's already starting to happen in some parts of these metaverses where neighborhoods 
are looking less and less um, familiar, honestly. I think they're looking a little bit corporate. Um, so it's a great question and we should do a whole talk just on like gentrification. Maybe we look at, um, in the next chat, we're gonna visit some places in real time um, and across Decentraland, Insomnium and CryptoVoxels. So maybe we'll visit like good examples and then really bad examples and see some stuff where it's like, oh no, uh, you know, Facebook took over in this corner or something. That would, that would be interesting, maybe a little contentious. Um, Here's a question. I think we should, this is, um, uh, this is, do you think we should continue to use a Facebook owned product to view decentralized metaverses? Very good point. Very good point. Um, and it's a kind of a, kind of a contradiction that I'm using Oculus, right? To like hop into this world. Uh, that's a really good point. I don't think we should. I think we should be supporting decentralized products and communities. And um, so, yeah, no, it's a really good question. And you called me out. I use an Oculus to go into an Ethereum world, and that's kind of a contradiction. <laughs> I think we're going to see a lot of that in the beginning because it's a way of onboarding people into this world. We're going to have to use Kind of established products and services but i think as the space matures we're going to use a lot more local tools um like for example i know a lot of 3d modelers who do nft art were using render farms for rendering their artwork and their animations and um uh, a lot of folks who were using these render farms transferred over i believe to a token on ethereum it was like a decentralized rendering service called, I think it was Render. Um, I need to look that up. But um, I think we'll start to see more options for this and more localized solutions that aren't like Facebook owned. We will get there, I'm sure. Uh, I also hope real world problems aren't repeated on these metaverses. In the last talk that we had, the last question I asked everyone was, so where do you think this is going? Is this a utopia or dystopia? And I think everyone felt that it could be both <laughs> in some ways. Um, it's a little frightening to see where some of this stuff is going, but I think, I think we'll have different, different approaches as the tools start to improve and get better. Um, but that last image I showed of all the cars piling up, it's going to be messy before it's clean. And I think we're going to see a lot of real world problems like gentrification impose themselves on virtual worlds because this is still an economy. It's an open economy. Uh, there's prices for all of this stuff. So I think we need a better solution than land that has a cost. We need better ways to get people to build than having to afford a plot of land virtually that costs like a minimum of $10,000 right now. That's too high of a barrier, and that's not the ethos of this movement, I think. Yeah, it is. Uh, uh, McCall is saying uh, using Windows to download a Metaverse app. It is. It's silly. It's just weird. So hopefully they're not tracking us. Uh, utopia, dystopia, dysupia. I think we're going to have a dysupia. It's going to be a soup of a whole bunch of stuff. This is fun. Um, does anyone have any other questions? You can feel free to write in the chat. I'm going to use dysupia. Dysupia? Dysupia? I think it's like soup. It's like you're not sure what's really what's really under there sometimes. Could be anything. <laughs> um, but it's a really cool topic. And I think uh, for architecture, you know, architecture is one of those extraordinarily gated sort of disciplines and professions. And it's one of the reasons I left it um, a few years ago, I felt like we were catering to very specific clients and very specific people. And I think what 
we see now is architecture is opening up. People can participate and build in their own way, in their own flavor. And uh, there's lots of opportunity. And I think it's just creating a different type of discipline. And for architecture itself, I think the discipline of architecture is going to dramatically evolve over the next few years. And um, I think we're all, all of us are at the forefront of that right now, which is pretty cool. Uh, here's another question. How do you think the ideas of inhabiting space in the metaverse will change the architecture of material space? For us, it is very crazy to think of it in a Latin American context. Um, really good question. Uh, you know, in this last year, in this last couple of years, uh, we've been thinking of it as kind of everyone in their apartment box. Everyone in New York in my neighborhood has been kind of walled in. I don't have a lot of space. <laughs> I live in a Brooklyn apartment. It's not big. It's not spacious. Um, so while I've been in this kind of white box room with a tiny window um, looking out over a fire escape, you you put on your VR set and you're in a totally different world. It expands that dramatically. So I think what I'm a little bit afraid of is kind of the ready player one sort of thing where everyone's in a kind of small physical space and it's augmented by an expansive infinite virtual space. I do think that's part of the utopia dystopia and I do think that we are going to start to see architecture and physical environments reflect that. I'm a little afraid because I think that does mean like people are going to live in cubes <laughs> if we're if we're going further down that line. Um, and I think we've seen some of that in um, We've seen some of that start to play out in kind of how people are designing modern cities. Um, but I hope, I hope what we do and I hope what happens is we are able to acknowledge and embrace the, the good parts of the natural and built world and have that folded into our lives in a way that doesn't force us into a cube, into a box to like enter the metaverse. I think that's snow crash is also is like, you know, there are bad parts, very like scary parts of that novel that I don't think Facebook totally realizes that they might actually build, um, which would force us into a cube and away from the world around us. So we need to build a balance and, and demand it um, because it's ultimately up to us as users what we, what we demand and what we want. Um, but I do worry for materiality. I mean, if, if, uh, <laughs> I don't think people are going to build with expensive materials if, uh, there's no need to see, touch, or feel them anymore. So we might have a weird new world on our hands. That's a little dark. I don't mean to go too dark on that, but it's going to be interesting over the next, you know, 20, 30 years, um, as buildings start to react to this. The cities react. Um, but yeah, I think um, in different parts of the world, it'll have a different pace too. I think, you know, different uh, places have different densities or more accustomed to different densities. And uh, I think different parts of the world will be more fluent with living a certain way, I think. Um, I did a lot of, uh, I've done a lot of research on like different housing types um, uh, when I when I was in school and some of my professional work afterwards. And um, I think it's very local. So I think we'll have in some ways localized solutions to this that react to the metaverse. Um, uh, here's a good question. Um, Stefan says, is land in the metaverse scarce or infinite? I think it depends on the metaverse. That's a big, big debate right now is should it be scarce or should it be infinite? And I think the first move has been make it scarce. But that repeats a lot of the issues that we've had in the real world of land being scarce and hard to come by and extremely expensive. Um, so I don't think that's a sustainable solution. I think that's going to recreate the same gentrification issues that we were talking about earlier. Um, right now, Decentraland, um, I think, is coming is having that issue. A lot of these worlds are having that issue. 
And, uh, oh, yeah, no, we're totally, the South Park predicts the future, for sure. They know. They already know. I'm reacting to an image in the chat here. Um, so I, I think land should be designed in a way that is infinite. And I think place should be scarce. And I think there's a big distinction there because land is gives people the ability to create and build. Um, those tools should be democratized for everyone. That ability should be accessible to everyone. But creating a place, I think, should be a scarce thing. It challenges people to create something as a community to coalesce around a, um, an idea and a style, a project. And I think having a place is something that should be rare and I think still can be rare in a virtual world. But the land itself, I don't. it doesn't make any sense for that to be scarce, in my opinion. Um, I think that was a way to justify the economics of it early on and make it familiar. Um, because why would you invest, you know, a couple years ago in buying pixelated land if you didn't see any of this stuff yet? This stuff wasn't out there. Um, Decentraland had their land auction before any of this was visible. So it was a huge kind of like leap of faith in some respects. Um, but I think that is a really, really, really key question. Should we go scarce or infinite? Um, is it possible to do both? In a way, I was thinking, like, just imagine, yeah, like, infinitely scarce. So, like, you could actually have value on, like, more centralized places, you know, like, so any, like, real, so land around, like, high volume areas could be more expensive, but then you could get cheaper and cheaper and uh, the further away from those places you go. I 100% agree. I think that's that's part of what I mean by a uh, place should be scarce um, because it, it's kind of implying that like if you build up a community that's distinct from a community that's, you know, down the street from it, that becomes a place. And the land might be able to expand infinitely around it, but all of a sudden you have kind of a cluster of land or a place that is more valuable to be around because more people are there, more people are doing things there. I, I think you're totally right, and I think it, it, it can be both. Um, I hope it's both, because uh, I also think it's silly that we're still building, like, land plots that go in one direction or another. Like, we have no gravity to worry about. Why are we still building on land? It's just silly to me. So I'm waiting for a metaverse that goes, like, up and down, not just side to side. Um, I think it's silly that we, <laughs> we're designing the same rules of our physical world still in a lot of these projects. Cool, okay. So I know we're coming up to uh, half, well, the end of the class, but we're gonna be having a, another class with Kirk, which will be a tour of all of the metaverses, which was super fun last time. Um, yeah, so thank you so much. Yeah, thank you guys so much. And thanks so much, Nicole. Um, this is great. Also, uh, just to, um, I think I haven't said this, but there is an architecture channel, um, which I think you should all see. Um, actually, no, you don't. So I will I will add the permissions uh, for all of you to see it. But basically, there's like a, an architecture channel where you can chat to Kirk. He's usually very active on it. Uh, we've been discussing like a few projects we did uh, with the first cohort of the residency there. So you you can also see what um, basically what the, the the resident artists are building in Somnium there. Uh, and yeah, if you have like any questions at all, like that's just a dedicated channel for all things architecture, metaverse, etc. Does that work, Kirk? Still? Yeah. No. Definitely. If you guys have any questions, uh, big or small, feel free to drop them in that channel and that way others can see and that we can have kind of a record of, of questions answered too, which will be helpful for folks as they pop in and out. Um, but yeah, next time we're going to do a tour so you won't hear me blab on for too long. We're going to visit some interesting builds and places. Uh, yeah, also we all love you. We all love to hear you blab because the voice is just so soothing. <laughs> Jeez. I think it's because I'm, I'm listening like listening to a documentary. I think somebody was saying before. <laughs> oh, jeez, you guys are nice. Uh, I think it's uh, yeah, 
<laughs> Sorry, the channel is already available. Yes, Felipe, I just I just added uh, so you can you can you should all be able to see it. Uh, there's uh, Walt and Murat who are like chatting about the Somnium Space build, um, where we have some land from the Museum of Crypto Art. They'll also be chatting to you tomorrow, no, Thursday. So we'll have, a, I think we'll probably talk about this as well. But yeah, so feel free to ask any questions uh, there. Too. And thank you so much, Kirk. Yeah, thank you guys. Great to talk to, with all of you and meet you all. Thank you. Bye bye. Bye-bye.